Okay. Um, welcome everyone. I'll give a couple of minutes for everyone to join our uh, seminar. I hope that you can hear me very well. I'm really happy to welcome you to our second webinar. Uh, which is called Council of Europe, uh, the uh, uh, conscience of Europe in a time of crisis. Uh, thank you very much for everyone who uh, joined us here uh, in, in our Zoom meeting. And also thank you for those who are uh, with us uh, on YouTube. Uh, the panelists, uh, my name is Konstantin Tixero and I'm a chair of this uh, uh, seminar. Uh, I will introduce the uh, panelists and the topic and then I will pass uh, to Stuart later on. Uh, the panelists were very nice and they agreed to take uh, uh, questions and comments. Uh, so please do engage with us. And uh, uh, there are three ways actually to ask your question. Uh, the first one is you can ask it on Twitter using hashtag uh, uh, HR versus VS COVID. And uh, we will see it and uh, ask the panelists uh, your questions. The second one is if you are here in Zoom, and uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, uh, there is a special button uh, that allows you to raise your hand. And uh, we will uh, uh, give you a floor after the panelists. And uh, the final way is uh, uh, basically uh, if you write your question in the chat. So you can either direct it to one of the chairs or to everyone and we will ask the uh, participants to react to this question at the end. There also, is, uh, there also is a live stream on YouTube now, so you can join the uh, live stream if you want. Uh, the uh, link to the live stream was uh, actually uh, sent in the advertisements um, advertisements earlier uh, and also uh, this will be recorded and uh, it will be uh, later uploaded to on the uh, YouTube channel of the International Law and Human Rights Unit of the University of Liverpool. So that's all technical parts of it. Uh, I wanted just to make a quick introduction to the topic, to the idea and I only wanted to say that there is uh, effectively a quite a significant paradox uh, related to human rights and uh, what the Council of Europe and especially the European Court of Human Rights can do. Uh, human rights institutions, especially the court, are really needed during emergencies. And I'm not talking about uh, formal uh, emergencies. Uh, we have discussed this issue of legal emergencies a little bit earlier, uh, two weeks ago. Um, I'm talking about de facto uh, uh, emergencies, factual uh, emergencies. However, the ongoing impact of the European Court of Human Rights is rather limited, and I would argue that it cannot be more than it can, the court cannot do more than it can. Um, and uh, it cannot quickly influence the situation during these extraordinary uh, times. So today we will discuss uh, expectations and reality. What uh, expectations from the Council of Europe uh, are and uh, what reality is. Not only from uh, the Council of Europe, but also from the Apex, National Apex Court, and what they can and should do in, in, in reality. We have five uh, fantastic speakers today, and uh, they will be able to look at uh, the questions that we are raising from various angles. Uh, they will all have about 10 minutes uh, uh, to cover a particular aspect of the theme of the seminar, and then I will ask Stuart to take over for questions and answers. So without any further uh, uh, delay, and I don't want to take any more of your time, 
I would like to pass the floor to uh, Justice uh, Ineta Zimile. Uh, Judge Zimile is the president of the Constitutional Court of Latvia, and she also served uh, as the judge of the European Court of Human Rights uh, in Strasbourg, so she can uh, cover uh, what the courts can do in this situation, both from international and national perspective. Um, Judge Zimile, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for agreeing to join us today. Yes, uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon and good evening to uh, everyone who is uh, linked uh, in uh, himself or herself to our discussion. Um, I will definitely uh, speak from the point of view of um, what do we do in practice. So I have a practitioner's um, perspective and uh, experience uh, since uh, in the Constitutional Court uh, in Latvia, we are uh, currently actually, well, trying to deal with uh, the limitations that uh, the um, health uh, crisis has caused. But at the same time, uh, we are fully aware that uh, it is particularly important in times as these that uh, the uh, justice system, the judiciary, uh, continues to work. And uh, that there are important uh, also visual messages coming out, not only sort of disputes solved and then the two parties know it, but also that uh, the judiciary and especially the top judiciary uh, uh, across Europe, uh, Europe being uh, the rule of law um, uh, space, uh, that the judiciary also informs and keeps informing uh, the society as to uh, what uh, they do. As you know, Latvia has uh, declared state of emergency and uh, Latvia has submitted uh, relevant statements to the Council of Europe uh, and also to the uh, uh, United Nations. And uh, in such circumstances, uh, the issue really arose, uh, how uh, does uh, sort of the protection of human rights um, in Latvia take place? Uh, because uh, the state of emergency um, uh, decision uh, was adopted due to the fact that it was evident to us that we need to restrict a number of fundamental civil rights, such as freedom of assembly, freedom of association, uh, freedom of religion. And in order to do that uh, lawfully, uh, according to the rules of the game uh, that we know in Europe, we had to declare uh, the state of uh, emergency. Now, uh, at the same time, early on, uh, which was um, um, the state of emergency was declared on 13 March, and within a week, uh, all of the uh, institutional organs representing the three branches of power uh, reunited uh, on virtually um, on, on, uh, on a platform, video platform, where uh, we, uh, in fact, agreed uh, on uh, basic uh, constitutional um, principles that uh, are impossible to give up uh, in during the, the, the state of uh, emergency. Um, for example, it was very clear that the most difficult time is for the parliament. Uh, mind you, you have other examples across Europe where it shows that the parliament uh, has the uh, greatest difficulty to function, to carry out uh, uh, its functions in the state of, uh, state of emergency. And we took the decision that uh, we have to try our best to ensure that all three branches of power, in fact, do continue working and that we, without, we do not leave um, decisions on restrictions of human rights solely uh, in the hands of the government. There has to be parliamentary control over it and the judicial control over it. So uh, although I must say there are discussions, even in Latvia, uh, saying um, uh, that, uh, well, it would be maybe easier um, to, to have the government deal with, with all of this uh, crisis and um, state of emergency. Um, there are these discussions. It's not easy, of course, but um, I think the, the, the view prevails um, that uh, at the level of decision-making and largely also in the civil society, 
that uh, the branches of power um, have to, uh, within the possible uh, uh, limits, uh, have to continue working and and actually sort of show the the, the signs of normalcy that the state can function uh, normally uh, uh, as much as possible. Now, um, probably in Latvia, uh, we are possibly in an easier situation because of the strong IT sector that we've had, uh, similar to Estonia, uh, as you know, uh, Estonia and Latvia are very well uh, equipped in this regard, and therefore moving uh, for us, the judiciary, for the constitutional court, but also the courts of general jurisdiction, moving to having meetings, deliberations on, uh, well, Zoom, for example, or we use other platforms, um, was not such a difficult uh, uh, step uh, to take. So um, we uh, continue working, um, deliberating the cases as, uh, as uh, planned, in fact. Uh, this week we are going into uh, public hearing, so written uh, proceedings are easier, of course, um, but public hearing, um, that will be interesting. Maybe we are the first ones, <laughs> one of the top courts, um, to do that in Europe. So on Thursday, uh, we are going into um, having the, uh, the parties um, sort of presenting their arguments um, in a case uh, that we had scheduled and we decided uh, not to postpone it. The reason we decided not to postpone it is because you just think about it. Um, if all of the courts sort of because of the impossibility or maybe sort of inflexibility um, of, of the presidents in charge keep postponing the cases, arguing the, the, the health crisis or state of emergency, then the backlog and the docket will continue uh, growing and that really is just as delayed. So it is these issues that have to be very seriously uh, taken into account. Um, when we decided on how to adopt uh, the proceedings that the way the Constitutional Court carries them out in, in, in public, um, um, in public uh, trials, we of course um, were trying to adjust because on the one hand you have to comply with the rules of a distance, two meters distance, you have to comply with the rule of you know limited socialization and that is in order to protect the health of this uh, of the society on the other hand you have all of the fair trial guarantees that you have to provide um, in the public hearing so when we were adjusting um, uh, the, uh, the the plan for thursday how to carry out uh, the uh, the uh, public hearing so we were you know weighing uh, these, um, uh, these uh, both uh, important uh, values and I do believe that we have come to a correct sort of way to proceed. Um, in fact, uh, on YouTube you will be able to follow on Thursday if you, in case you are interested in, um, on the court's uh, YouTube, uh, Latvian Constitutional Court's YouTube. It starts at one o'clock <laughs> um, Latvian time. Um, so you can uh, make uh, the calculations. Now, as far as the daily work is concerned, you know that for the judiciary, it's of course also uh, very important measures of precaution that are on daily basis taken. For example, you do not, you cannot take case files out home and work from home. You do have to work in the court. Now, uh, this restriction, um, uh, I took a decision to lift it and uh, I gave a permission to the court's lawyers and naturally the judges to take the copies of the case files out because we do work, although I'm in the office, but I'm alone <laughs> in the court because everybody uh, works uh, from home and the judges are joining in uh, uh, like we are right now for the um, uh, deliberations. And so there are such um, uh, issues. Um, now, the Parliament, Latvian Parliament, also has uh, moved to, to uh, working with the distance and, uh, and uh, spreading out as, as much as possible and, and voting uh, on the programs, platforms that allow for voting. 
So that is all possible if you have the uh, technologies, the programs, and the and the technical uh, the equipment uh, necessary. So the what we can an interim conclusion that I have is with um, uh, with a little bit of Im imagination, with um, a lot of uh, uh, means available, and uh, uh, sort of um, uh, a very sober weighing of the values that do clash uh, in these circumstances. Nevertheless, uh, the judiciary and the state as such uh, can continue functioning uh, within the, uh, the, the principles of, of democracy and, and rule of law with uh, really limited sort of restrictions as far as division of powers is concerned. Now, um, it, of course, the, the daily work is slowed down also. Uh, it is slower compared to when we sort of are next to each other, sitting behind the table together and um, discussing. Now, um, what is particularly important in terms of, that is already important for the protection of human rights. So that the structure is in place, the system is in place, uh, and the mechanisms work. Um, as far as the actual assessment uh, of the decisions um, taken, uh, which in the state of emergency restrict uh, human rights, um, it was very important that when we adopted a joint communique, all of the branches of power, we indicated that the criteria of strict necessity is very important to follow when the decisions are taken to restrict uh, human rights. And that was important to have that publicly in the communique, and then the public debate lawyers could pick it up and sort of look from that perspective at the decisions taken by the government and then approved uh, by the parliament. Um, the fact that the constitutional court um, functions and functions as planned, I think also sends a very important uh, message that the constitutional court uh, is ready, if the case comes, uh, to assess it in accordance with the criteria um, worked out, uh, I think, during decades of experience and uh, to be applied uh, in, the, uh, in the context of um, a state of emergency. Now, um, what I wish, and this, this is my final sort of two comments, um, what I think uh, would have been necessary, and I think we fail in Europe, although we could have not <laughs> failed because we have common standards and also um, sort of institutions in place, I think the, the so-called um, uh, judicial dialogue uh, mechanism that uh, we have worked on for quite some time, um, and European Court of Human Rights, for example, was, a, was one of the first ones to sort of launch itself into, into the um, uh, various types of, uh, of judicial dialogue. Now, there I thought uh, it could have been used for a more common approach among the top uh, courts uh, in Europe as to, you know, how they uh, see their role uh, in the times of crisis, because I do believe it's not only for, you know, the German constitutional court, which has already adjudicated, probably you heard, uh, there is a judgment on, on, on COVID, uh, or the Latvian constitutional court, which, which works as usual, uh, and, and, and thereby also guarantees that, that the rule of law will be uh, upheld. I think there was a need in Europe, in the, in the common legal space that we have, for a kind of a more uh, common stance or even a message out there that, uh, you know, this is how the courts uh, 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 see uh, uh, their role it hasn't changed and the assessment of proportionality of interference is there. There is to have that, there is a need for one leading court. Uh, it could have been the European Court of Human Rights, uh, indeed. And Constantine, this is here, not necessarily in adjudicating uh, the cases, although that can be done too, if the court in Strasbourg would have appropriate technology, uh, et cetera, that, that I don't know, I leave it to them to, to tell what they have. But, um, uh, there is no question that the work can continue fast. Second, uh, that it would, would have been actually a role of the European Court of Human Rights to have a kind of 
like this a webinar among all of the uh, top constitutional supreme courts for example in the midst of state of emergency well with the discussion exactly of the issues that we are going uh, through has the state declared state of emergency or it hasn't um, where has what what's the role of the parliament for example and the judiciary or does the power concentrate totally and entirely in the hands of the government i mean there is plenty that you know, could be discussed at a more pan-European level. And I think that would be really a European um, thing to do. Um, I have not uh, 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 received um, information on any such idea or um, invitation to, to any uh, such idea. So I, I do not know uh, whether anyone has thought about it or sees the things that way. I personally uh, would would think we could have done it, or maybe we can still do it. So I stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Judge. I think it's uh, very, very important to remember about uh, unity in Europe uh, uh, when it comes to fighting uh, with this uh, extraordinary circumstance. And uh, it, 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 it was very, very uh, important that you articulated uh, this uh, particular point. Uh, with that in mind, I would like to give a floor to our second uh, uh, panelist. It's uh, Jörg Polakiewicz, who is the Director of Legal Advice and Public International Law, and also Legal Advisor to the, of the Council of Europe. Uh, I would like uh, uh, Jörg uh, to uh, discuss what the Council of Europe can and uh, uh, should do in these circumstances, maybe to pick up on what Judge uh, uh, Zimile just said about coordination between courts in these difficult circumstances. See me now? Is it okay? The Okay, you hear me also? Yes, I do, and probably everybody else does as well. Okay, no, thanks. No, because there was a technical problem. Because although it is true, um, maybe this is uh, one of the few positive things of this period that uh, you discover so many new electronic tools. And some of them, they are really amazing, but I must also say from my experience, personal experience at least, uh, there's almost always some technical issue when you <laughs> start them. And not always they, they work so perfectly. Um, but um, first of all, yeah, let me thank you, Constantine and your colleagues for organizing this wonderful event. I think it's really very timely. And uh, as said, uh, I would, I speak of course, I should stress in my purely personal capacity, I would like to share a few reflections with you on, on this crisis and what the Council of Europe is doing and can do. Uh, I think as uh, Ineta said, uh, I think we are facing really unprecedented restrictions of fundamental rights. Uh, I think since the Second World War, we had not such a situation that affects also so simultaneously Simultaneously, all countries uh, of the continent and uh, we had just uh, as an example uh, we had uh, we had 10 member states of the Council of Europe derogating uh, law issuing formal derogations from the convention which we uh, have of course notified to all parties and the court and the parliamentary assembly we in Strasbourg, we did not either encourage or discourage uh, these derogations. Uh, personally, I think they are perfectly okay. They are justified uh, in this. It's not something that is necessarily negative to derogate uh, because after all, this is a function of the convention, which makes it applicable precisely, shows that it's applicable also in these emergency situation and after all it allows uh, oversight and control by the organs of the Council of Europe, uh, the Secretary General, the Committee of Ministers and the Parliamentary Assembly. 
but uh, the crisis, uh, and this is also the unprecedented thing, has also affected directly the functioning of our organization to a, also, I would say, unprecedented uh, effect. Uh, in the sense that um, normally the Council of Europe, we are intergovernmental organization and uh, we rely on political organs like the Committee of Ministers, the Parliamentary Assembly, on monitoring mechanisms, technical committees that all as a principle physically meet. Uh, but precisely this has become impossible due to the travel restrictions but also quarantine or confinement restrictions that are applicable in France like in most countries in Europe which meant uh, that practically since we are in fact uh, the committee of ministers has not convened uh, and uh, also the other committees and there are of course these electronic tools I agree with Judge Ziemler that they are tremendous and also I pay tribute to our IT system that they we I must say in terms of business continuity it's quite amazing what we achieved in the sense now more than 80 percent of the staff works from home and uh, meetings take essentially place by video conferencing but there are issues uh, that are maybe more complicated in an international context than more than in a national like Latvia we have issues of data security confidentiality uh, but also simply from a legal point of view uh, we have this uh, in fact I've never given so many for well, our my my service has never been asked so much about written procedures, video conferencing, and to what extent this complies with the existing regulations. And there is a real problem that most of our bodies, for example, the Committee of Ministers, but also the Assembly, have no explicit rules uh, in force that would allow video conferencing explicitly. And uh, even written procedures are often not uh, very well defined. So we, in, in the beginning, in fact, we, we, we had to be very creative in a sense uh, to, uh, and we took the position, maybe rather bold, but I think one has to be creative in these times of crisis, to argue that uh, with force majeure and unforeseeability, that still even in the absence of explicit rules, you can also, with the idea that you have to allow the functioning of bodies that are, have been established and are even more important probably in these times of crisis than before, that they have somehow be able to function. So we, we said basically that many of these, uh, even if there are no explicit rules, it is, there are no legal obstacles, uh, if there are of course certain safeguards, that these uh, bodies adopt decisions through written procedure and hold meetings by video conferencing. But there are limits, uh, as I said, it's not always uh, going so smoothly. But just to give a few examples, the Committee of Ministers uh, will meet tomorrow by video conference. It has adopted already by written procedure a very important recommendation on algorithms and, uh, and human rights. Uh, I think this is also an example. Algorithms are very much in use and they are very positive in many aspects, but they raise also issues about discrimination and privacy. Uh, so I think these guidelines were very timely and they could be adopted, as I said, by written procedure only. Tomorrow also, for example, the, the business to a certain extent continues. The Committee of Ministers will, by written procedure, invite non-member states to join important conventions. For example, uh, Kazakhstan and Tunisia will join the, our Istanbul Convention, the Convention on Violence, on violence against women and also this convention body one of the monitoring mechanisms is has been this is very important i think this is an area of human rights which in this crisis is very relevant because why because in this period often the victims and the perpetrators of domestic violence they are forced to more or less to live together and there's no escape so this committee also by video conferencing and written procedure adopted just yesterday an important declaration and it contains also guidelines how 
the provisions, some key provisions of this convention can be applied, must be applied by the parties in particular in these uh, circumstances of uh, confinement and quarantine. Um, also, we had uh, we introduced uh, electronic signatures uh, that allowed, for example, continuing functioning of bodies also like the Council of Europe Development Bank. You hear these days a lot of the, of the, the European Union uh, money, but the Council of Europe, of course, is not the European Union in terms of budget and financial means, but still the Development Bank issued uh, COVID-19 response social inclusion bonds uh, of some of 1 billion uh, bonds, uh, which uh, will benefit social projects all over Europe, but also gave a million, a 300 million euro loan to Italy. Rimage normally should have had a meeting immediately in the beginning, middle of March, but uh, through written procedure and with electronic signature is able to continue to, to uh, give subsidies to the uh, co of cinematographic co-productions in Europe. Last but not least, I should mention uh, for the Secretary General, she issued a toolkit, a very important tool uh, on the uh, on how, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the Google Toolkit contains guidance to governments how to respect human rights and democratic principles in the times of crisis. And also, maybe the most active uh, organ in these days is the Commissioner. But I think there's also a reason for it, because the Commissioner does not have to rely on any collective body authorizing her to speak or to act. Uh, she's a one woman show. And uh, I think her statements in this time of crisis, of course, she does not travel, she does not do country visits, but she issued important statements on protection of journalists. Uh, she called for the release of detainees, uh, migrants in particular, and many member states have followed, in fact, her advice. And also an important statement on an issue which was now overshadowed by, uh, by uh, the COVID crisis, but which is, I think, one of the most uh, important challenges uh, for, for Europe, uh, which really tarnishes the image of Europe in the world, that is the rescue, or rather sometimes non-rescue at sea of, uh, of uh, of migrants and, and refugees uh, going through over the Mediterranean Sea. So you can see, I mean, as I say, I, what might be not be as positive as Judge Zima, that everything is possible electronically. I think there are limits and we must really also ensure that the tools we use are both uh, privacy compliant but also secure. And we can unfortunately not always be sure of this. And, um, but on the whole, I think the Council of Europe has still demo has demonstrated that it is able to function, albeit on reduced and, and as I, I agree also, it, everything is more slow in a certain sense, uh, but there has been important uh, outputs uh, that the Council of Europe or guidance the Council of Europe and its bodies have produced. Just to finish, uh, two reflections. Uh, I think one thing is we should really, the first thing to do once it will be possible, I hope quite soon, to have normal meetings again is that all those bodies that have not, uh, ex, uh, that have not procedures uh, for electronic and written use of electronic means and written procedure, I think they have to update their procedures and the tools we have in place should be, as I said, uh, also secure and privacy compliant. And I also very much agree, I think we need a reflection on the whole uh, proportionality discussion. Um, this is my last remark. I think there is a lot, it's, it's funny, it's, a, it's interesting to see that this concept of proportionality, which I think was developed nationally uh, in, in, in some countries was very well developed in my own country, Germany, for example, as a national concept and then via the European courts, uh, both Strasbourg and Luxembourg uh, has become a kind of pan-European standard. 
But if you see now how it is applied in practice, you see vast differences. So uh, I think things that are very much questioned in Germany and other countries, they pass without anybody raising an eyebrow because the crisis is also so affecting directly the right to life, uh, the very existence of the public health uh, sectors, the hospitals. So uh, this goes very much to the core of human rights protection. So everybody agrees with stringent uh, measures, but also now where we are now hopefully, at least in some countries going already to loosen some of these restrictions. I think human rights again are very important that one should not only see them in the sense they are prohibitions uh, to protect the right to life or the functioning of the hospital sector, but we must also help hold governments account what have they done proactively to make a normal life more possible again or to also allow less restrictions. Have they, for example, what have they done to ensure that relevant uh, equipment is available, that health workers and doctors have these protective masks and equipment which are still lacking in some countries? And and uh, I think these are important questions. We should not, we cannot give everything in the hands uh, of uh, science, of just scientists. Moreover, they are still sometimes contradicting each other. I think there is a role for a democratic discussion and also a legal discussion about proportionality in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much, York. It was very, very interesting and important. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, the European Court of Human Rights will have uh, a lot of work to do in assessing the proportionality of some of the measures than some of the uh, contracting parties to the convention are uh, adopting. And also, like I, I very much agree with you that uh, positive obligations on the, of the contracting parties are extremely important in these circumstances. And uh, uh, in two weeks' time, we will have another webinar discussing uh, these positive obligations that the uh, contracting parties have in the situation of this crisis. So thank you very much for a very, very important uh, contribution now. Now I would like to pass the floor uh, to uh, Veronika Bilkova. She's uh, a member of the Venice Commission, I think, since 2010 and also a member of the board of the European Society of International Law. And she also holds positions in, uh, um, in, in Charles University in Prague, as well as uh, in the Institute of International Relations. Uh, and I see that she's complying with uh, the Czech regulations and she's wearing a mask. I think that the Czech rules are the, well, among the most restrictive in Europe at the moment. So she, it will be very interesting to hear how it feels uh, in Prague right now and also like uh, more generally. Thank you very much, Veronica, for joining. Hello. I hope you can hear me despite the face mask. Good yes, yes, evening yes. Or good afternoon to everyone. It is really a pleasure to be taking part in this event. I haven't talked to almost anyone for virtually six weeks, so seeing so many faces makes a really nice change. I was originally supposed to speak not only about the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe, but also about the Czech Republic, but I've decided to focus on the former only. But just to give you a bit of the flavor of what the life is like uh, now in the Czech Republic, I've put on the face mask. So now we, are, uh, we have the obligation to wear these face masks any, anywhere outside our home virtually. Uh, it's definitely a good thing to rob a bank with. <laughs> it's not such a good thing to speak in, but fortunately there is an exception. I do not need to wear a face mask at home. And since I am at home, I will take it off. So you can see me now. <laughs> it's really, it's quite difficult to speak in, in the mask. So in my presentation or in my, in my short talk, I want to cover two things. I would like first to make some general comments and then I will move to the Venice Commission. So starting with the general comments, these are not related so much or not only to the Venice Commission and probably not only to the Council of Europe, they are more general. 
it seems to me that what we are facing today due to the pandemics or maybe what the pandemics has revealed is a double crisis of trust or confidence uh, on the one hand, the trust in international institutions or international solutions more generally. And on the other hand, the crisis of trust in human rights or maybe values more generally. And I think this is important for our debate today. So starting with the first one, the pandemics obviously is a common global problem. So we might expect that states would try to find common global or at least regional solutions to this common global problem. But actually, uh, this has not really happened. And what we see instead is states or people even retreating beyond national borders, both in the figurative sense and also in the literal sense of national borders. We also see states blaming international institutions, not so much probably the Council of Europe, but the European Union, the WHO, for either the lack of activities or for taking wrong decisions, doing wrong things. We obviously might hope that this retreat into the national and the blaming of the international is just a temporary phenomenon. But if it is not, and if the, if the trust into international solutions and international institutions is undermined, then it will obviously have an impact on what the Council of Europe and other international organizations can do. So this is the first crisis. The second one relates to human rights or values more generally. We hear more and more often that human rights are here just for good times. When the sky is blue and the sun shines, then we apply human rights. But when this is not the case, then we simply close the doors, close the windows, switch off the light, and we do whatever is necessary, and then decide whether we would invite human rights back to the room again. We also hear that in times like this, that means in times of emergency, we can't protect everyone. We have to discriminate, and we probably have to sacrifice some people based on very general criteria such as age, wealth, social status. And what is the most striking for me is that we hear these things in the richest countries of the world, which have prided themselves for years of being human rights champions, of being the most decent and civilized. So again, we might think that this is a, last, a temporary phenomenon, that it doesn't mean anything, that maybe it's just the first reaction to the shock of the pandemics, which obviously is the biggest challenge that probably most of us have encountered in our lives. Yet again, if this is not so, then we will have a serious problems, not only with institutions, but also with the concepts that we are trying to promote. And I think we should keep this in mind because I'm not that sure that with the emergency measures abolished, as they will be uh, later on, that this mentality of distrust towards institutions and towards values will not survive. Now moving to the, to the second part, I would like to briefly cover what the Venice Commission has already done with respect to the current pandemics and what it might do and intends to do sometimes. And just to recall briefly, because I'm not sure that everyone is really familiar with the Venice Commission, so the Venice Commission is an expert body of the Council of Europe, whose main task is to provide assistance either to the Council of Europe or to other international organizations such as the European Union or to national states on issues having to do with uh, international law and constitutional law. So first, what we have done, what the Venice Commission has done so far and then what it might do and will do in future. So what we have done, three things. The first one, pretty obvious, and actually as a follow-up on what Jörg was talking about, the Venice Commission has cancelled its March session. It will most probably cancel its June session, and it has gone partly online, which might not seem a big achievement in general, but which I think is quite a big achievement for an organization or for a body which is rather old-fashioned and traditional in many ways. So we have, the, we have got partly online and partly 
uh, we've, we've uh, opted for the written procedure, encountering all the difficulties that Jörg was talking about, the lack of mandate or of the explicit uh, uh, mandate to, to, for instance, adopt opinions uh, through these procedures, the technical difficulties, etc. So this is the first thing. The second one, the Venice Commission, more exactly the Venice Commission Secretariat, has recently produced something that I will try to show. Hopefully you will, you will, no, you don't really see it, but anyway. Uh, so th this is the compilation of the Venice Commission opinions and reports on state of emergency. It should be available on the, on the website of the Venice Commission as soon as the website itself is available because it's, uh, it's off at the moment. So this compilation is a summary of the main conclusions of the Venice Commission related to the state of emergency. And it covers not only human rights issues, but also what I label as institutional issues. So for instance, whether you can have, hold elections in the times of emergency, whether the parliament can be dissolved and issues like that. Uh, issues which often get overlooked because we tend to focus on the human rights protection, but which I believe are equally important. So this compilation is the second thing. The third thing, which actually has not been adopted within or has not been done within the pandemic, but prior to it, quite some years ago, is for the Venice Commission to provide a set of opinions and country-specific opinions and general reports on the state of emergency. We have quite a rich case law, if I may use this term, on the state of emergency. And I will mention only two uh, outcomes which I think deserve particular attention, and that's the 2006 report on the protection of human rights in emergency situations, and then the recent 2016 opinion on emergency decrees adopted in Turkey. So that's kind of a practical application of the general standards. Through these opinions, reports, and now the compilation, the Venice Commission has kind of codified the main standards applicable in times of emergency. So it has played the role of the norm clarifier or norm reminder if, if a word like that exists in English. So that is what has been done. Now what might be uh, done in future and what the Venice Commission itself intends to do, two things. So first of all, we might and we really intend to uh, update and make more comprehensive the studies that we have already produced on the state of emergency. So there is a plan to produce an updated and more comprehensive study on the state of emergency, on the legal standards applicable in the state of emergency. And again, it should cover both the human rights standards, but also the institutional standards, elections, dissolutions of parliaments, etc. And the idea for the moment, and I hope it will be kept, though this is still in the discussion, so the idea is that the, the new uh, product will have an analytical part, but it will also have a part which we would label as a checklist. That means a set of concrete benchmarks and indicators which would allow to assess the state of respect for the legal standards in times of emergency. Something similar to what the Venice Commission has already done, for instance, in the field of the rule of law. And some of you might be familiar with the rule of law checklist. So this would be similar, but for the state of emergency. So this is, that is the first thing that we might do and that we will highly probably do in future. The second thing that we might do, and here it does not depend on the Venice Commission, we might provide country-specific opinions on COVID-19 related legislation adopted in particular countries. And obviously there are some obvious candidates for such an opinion. The advantage of such an opinion would be that unlike the European court, which will most probably be also confronted with these pieces of legislation, but which will take years, again, most likely to produce uh, its, its decisions, the Venice Commission, even in times of emergency, works in a very, fast, speedy manner. So we would be able to produce an opinion within months or even within weeks. So that would be, I think, helpful because we would have the, the assessment right at the time when 
uh, the situation is still developing. So that's the advantage. The disadvantage is that the Venice Commission cannot produce an opinion out of its own initiative. So the opinion would need to be requested either by the state itself, which obviously for some countries is not very probable, or by uh, the Council of Europe uh, organ or one of the Council of Europe organs, but we've heard just from Europe that the Council of Europe bodies uh, have difficulties working in these times. So that is what the Venice Commission has done. That is what the Venice Commission might do and most probably will do, partly. Now, what the Commission has not done and is not able to do is to uh, make sure that the, the legal standards, which are enshrined in the reports and opinions, are actually uh, abided by, are actually respected. It also may not, uh, uh, it also cannot make sure that the recommendations it will potentially write in or it will potentially make in the country-specific opinions related to the COVID-19 uh, related measures will be implemented at the national level. And whether this will happen, whether the states will abide by the standards and by the recommendations depends, in my opinion, to a large extent on whether uh, the, the two crisis of trust I, I spoke about at the beginning will really have a lasting effect on the state of human rights uh, in, in Europe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica. Indeed, uh, the issue of compliance is always an issue, isn't it, uh, uh, when we talk about international uh, decision-making mechanisms. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I have a small announcement before I give, I give a floor to Rob. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Judge Zimile has to uh, leave us. Uh, she uh, told me, and I'm unmuting her at the moment, that uh, she has two uh, judgments to write, uh, and uh, uh, they will not write themselves, unfortunately. So I would uh, like to thank uh, uh, Judge Zimile very much for uh, making this uh, intervention, and hopefully uh, we will... Uh, host you again at, at a different event. So thank you very much and have a good evening. Yes, thank you very much. And just to show you that the protection of human rights is ongoing, at least in some parts of Europe, I do go to the two draft judgments that we are deliberating tomorrow and it's really very late hour in Latvia, unfortunately. Um, so I, um, I wish you a, a, a most interesting continuation of the debate, which is extremely important and I hope to maybe uh, join you for another occasion. And uh, I wish all of us uh, good health and, uh, and keep working on uh, protecting our values. Have a, a lovely evening. Bye. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Judge Zimile. Uh, so uh, now uh, I would like to pass the floor to uh, Rob Linen who is the deputy UK rep uh, permanent representative to the uh, Council of Europe. And uh, I know uh, Rob for, for a couple of years and he has a lot of experience uh, in, 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 in relation to the Council of Europe. And uh, I asked Rob to look into the expectations of the member states. I guess uh, the United Kingdom will be the most uh, uh, appropriate uh, country he would look at. But, so, you know, the sky is the limit. So please, uh, um, I'm unmuting you at the moment. So thank you very much again for, for joining us. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. And, and good Tuesday to everyone, wherever you are in the world. And, and thanks for inviting me to this. It's actually been really interesting to hear the points of view so far. I'm going to talk very briefly about three things. Uh, first, I think there's a few general remarks that I think I obviously need to make. I think we've all been making very similar remarks, but I think they need to be said. The second is then I will touch on working methods a little bit as Jörg has already had done, and then talk about the substance of some of the work that we're approaching, both intergovernmentally and more broadly in the Council of Europe. Uh, it, of course, goes without saying that the 
the challenges that we're facing at this time from COVID-19 are utterly exceptional and unprecedented. And states are needing to take exceptional measures to halt the spread of COVID-19, as, as, as Judge Zimmler described as well. Um, and those measures, the, the, the measures taken to address the, the, the pandemic, are going to have profound effects on individuals and on societies, and inevitably an impact on people's enjoyment of their human rights. Now, this is obviously a serious public health emergency. And one of the key things that we've been emphasizing throughout is that human rights laws, including the, the ECHR, of course, including the convention, allow for restrictions to be placed on certain rights when we find ourselves responding to crises. Those laws themselves were written against often a backdrop of crisis. And so they, they have that baked into their very fiber. But it is vital that any restrictions that are placed on human rights are lawful, uh, both as a matter of international human rights law and national law. Uh, they should be targeted, they should be time limited, and of course, they should be subject to regular review to ensure they remain strictly necessary as a response to the pandemic. And overwhelmingly, what we have to be sure is that states must never use this or any other crisis as a cover for repressive action. Um, for example, silencing human rights defenders or journalists. Just because there's a pandemic on, it doesn't take away those human rights obligations. And I think that is essential for us to say. There is the obligation, it's been discussed already, we had the benefit of, of Jörg's advice on this previously, um, to derogate from human rights obligations. And some states have done so, we have chosen not to do so. We did not think it was necessary. Sorry, um, Siri wants to speak to me. Um, uh, we have not thought it necessary. Uh, we think that the the limitations and the uh, qualifications that exist, for example, within the convention rights are perfectly adequate to cover the measures that need to be taken. And indeed, that human rights framework isn't just an impediment to the action that we're taking, it is also a framework to think about what action needs to be taken as well. We've had the Human Rights Act now for 20 years. One of my previous jobs was actually delivering the training on that to, to many public officials. And it's always baked into our way of thinking now as policy officials, that this is how we go about making decisions in good times and bad. So turning then to the Council of Europe, as Jörg has said, it's perhaps an organisation for whom this has come as a little bit of a, a shock in terms of working methods. Um, I think it would be fair to say that the whole multilateral system relies hugely and heavily on in-person meetings. I think the whole diplomatic system does. Um, it's regrettable to a certain extent. And we hope that one of the things that will come out of this is actually that there'll be far less flying around the world to, to sit in meeting rooms for endless days on end. Um, that actually we might, as Jörg says, move to a more flexible and, and remote way of working where that gets the job done quickly. But for the Committee of Ministers, uh, as Jörg says, we are going to meet by video conference tomorrow. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that proceeds. I think it would be fair to say that not all of my head of mission colleagues are the most technically minded. So um, it, it could be an interesting experience, but we will report back once we have attempted it. Um, in particular, though, as it, it is exactly what's been said by other speakers. The importance here is that business keeps on going. The wheels keep turning. And particularly where it is the international and particularly the multilateral diplomatic system, each of those bodies has an important role to play. And playing that role is not just about being seen to keep going. This isn't just to some keep calm and carry on nonsense. It's actually an important substantive role. But what is that role? Um, there is a lot that the Council of Europe does that is hugely important and relevant to the present circumstances. Several examples have already been mentioned. Of course, the court. Just because there is a pandemic on it doesn't mean that urgent human rights issues will not be coming up, that the court will not need to address now as opposed to putting them off until times are better. And it is great the measures that have been put in place by the court to respect the, the COVID-19 restrictions in France, but still allow its urgent and important business to continue. Uh, we've heard about the Venice Commission. I think that is hugely important when there are states of emergency being declared, where restrictions are being placed on democratic principles, on the rule of law. 
Um, and I would really pay tribute to the Commissioner for Human Rights, who's been, I think, I, I swear she never leaves her computer keyboard, the, 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 the number of opinions she's been turning out, but they have been well-reasoned and direct, and, and, you know, we really welcome that. And there's other parts of the organisation too. We've seen principles uh, put out on areas relating to preventing torture and inhuman and degrading treatment on the management of prisons and so forth. But the theme running through all of this is that, to a certain extent, extraordinary times call for very ordinary measures, doing precisely what the organisation does normally. You, of course, have to apply it to the current circumstances. You have to respond to those circumstances. But when something like this happens, we don't invent something brand new. We don't go back to the drawing board and say, oh, crikey, a crisis is on. Let's work out how we respond to that. We have the response to it already in the international system. We have the instruments that were framed against that backdrop of crisis with the, the flexibility and the rules built into them to respond to it. We have the bodies that can respond to it. The importance is that those bodies orient their work towards the current issues, but carry on applying those same standards, applying as far as possible those same working methods and so on. Um, there's a, a thing that some people keep saying that, that every time there's a new issue that comes along, I mean, before this, it was artificial intelligence, for example, that, that there's some sort of strange competition that starts to happen in the multilateral system, that every organisation runs after it. Like, you know, if you've ever seen primary school children, so young children playing football, soccer, for any Americans who've wandered in and looking baffled, um, uh, you know, they all just run around the field after the ball. And there is a tendency sometimes for organisations to do that, to think there is some sort of competition to chase the latest issue, when actually, rather like watching you know, professional team sports so that way, by far the best way for the multilateral system to respond to this is for each player on that multilateral team to stick to their role, to flex to it, of course, to respond to the situation, but to stay doing their areas of speciality, to stick to the subjects that they know and respond to it in each of those fields. Um, I've heard, you know, lunatic ideas that the council could draft a new convention on the response to the, the, the crisis. No, we've got conventions for that. They're, they're perfectly good, what we need to work on. And I think what the Secretary General has produced is an excellent first step on this. The toolkit that Jörg mentioned is applying them to the current circumstances, responding to the challenges as they arise, and heaven knows there have been a number of already, uh, and making sure that the system that we have built maintains its strength and its integrity and is still there for the day after if I can put it like that. So overall, it's a challenging time for us in multilateral diplomacy generally. Of course, we have a lot of other issues that we are dealing with as a diplomatic and uh, a diplomatic system. Uh, we've been looking at returns and all matters of that variety as well, getting our, our nationals back to where they want to be. Uh, but overall, the goal has got to be to do the best we can to apply what we have and to keep those standards and those procedures turning just as they need to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Very, very interesting. And I think that it's very important to uh, indeed uh, remember what we uh, already have and also to not to use the crisis to, for improper uh, aims, to shut down uh, uh, opposition and uh, to uh, justify measures that are not strictly necessary in these circumstances. So I completely agree with you. Thank you very much for your really, really interesting uh, uh, intervention now. Uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to our last, but uh, by no means the least uh, uh, speaker, uh, Professor Philip Leach, who is a professor on, of uh, human rights law at uh, Middlesex University and also a director of a very well-known um, European Human Rights Advocacy Center and uh, uh, this uh, uh, speech, uh, this presentation, I asked him to talk about expectations a little bit from academia, from civil society, on what's, what, uh, what, what's, what international organizations are supposed to do. Uh, Phil, I'm trying to unmute you as I speak, uh, and we're doing that simultaneously with Stuart. And I think it should work now. Thank you very much. 
Can you hear me okay, Constantine? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much to you for the kind invitation to speak. I would like to uh, touch on two areas uh, this afternoon. Firstly, to say a few words about the role of the European Court of Human Rights itself, and then to uh, go on to say a little bit about, about the dangers of the exploitation of, of emergency powers that one or two have already uh, referred to already. So let me start with the court. And I think it's very important to uh, start by reminding us all that the, the primary role of the court is one of international supervision. It's subsidiary to the, to the role of national authorities and, it, and it's there to provide a safety net when national authorities fail us in, in some way. But one area where the court can and does act urgently is, of course, in relation to interim measures. And the classic use of interim measures is, as everyone will know, to uh, stop uh, removals when someone is uh, at risk of being uh, uh, taken, sent to a country where they're at risk of life or, or risk of, or, of uh, ill treatment in some way. But, um, Beyond that, the court has in recent years used that process to protect vulnerable people in other situations. And one of those areas is certainly to protect the health of prisoners. And it's a very well-established case law now, I would say, that um, it's reasonably common for the court to intervene in cases, in particularly in relation to vulnerable, very vulnerable prisoners who are ill or in other vulnerable situations, to require their access to independent medical experts uh, or to even to require them to be transferred to, uh, to civilian hospitals. And we saw that, for example, in the, in the Oleg Sensov case, the Ukrainian film director, when he was imprisoned in, in Russia. Um, so in the current context, it does seem to me that interim measures could be, could well be applied in relation to, to prisoners and, and other detainees, people in immigration centres, people in quarantine centres, and even to people in, uh, to residents of care homes and psychiatric hospitals. Now, um, what kind of scenario uh, is the court likely to apply interim measures? Well, I think the, the, the strongest scenario would be where you have a, a, a prison where there's evidence of, uh, of, of endemic overcrowding or other poor conditions, poor facilities, and you've got evidence of the virus having come into that particular facility, and where there is evidence of no discernible uh, strategy from the authorities to, to mitigate those risks. It seems to me that in those circumstances that the interim measures process um, could be, uh, could be utilised. But I want to actually go beyond that to that scenario too, because in recent years, um, there is again uh, evidence of the, a broadening of the scope of inter interim measures to a certain extent. And that's exemplified in, particularly in two decisions. One uh, in relation to the Georgia, the, Ruth, the Rustavi 2 case, which is about, um, about broadcasting, about uh, concerns about government control of the uh, television station Rustavi 2, where interim measures was used in that case. And a second case from Ukraine about the journalist Natalia Sedletska, uh, and interim measures was used there specifically to protect her sources as a journalist. Now those are, are, are quite interesting uh, precedents which take the interim measures process beyond the, the usual removal cases. And if one goes back to, to look at Rule 39 to see whether this power comes from, it's, it, it is written in, in very broad terms, and it's been interpreted by the Grand Chamber in subsequent cases as requiring an imminent risk of irreparable damage. Uh, and that's not necessarily confined to threats of life or personal integ integrity, as the, the Georgian and Ukrainian cases uh, exemplify. Now, having said all that, the court, I think, I think it's right to say the court has been, and I think will continue to be cautious around the application of interim measures. But I do think it's worth raising this question, um, this question of, of a broadening scope of, of interim measures in the context of the, the, the current risk we face of authoritarian governments 
riding roughshod over our fundamental rights, restricting freedom of information, in some cases restricting freedom of expression, uh, freedom of movement and, and, and so on. Beyond interim measures, can we expect the court to act urgently uh, in, in terms of substantive decisions on, on merits cases? And as a number of people have said, that's likely to be uh, based on the extent to which positive obligations are engaged. Uh, here, obviously, in relation particularly to, to uh, protect the right to life. And, and Jörg and others have mentioned the position of victims of domestic violence, violence against women, the, the evidence that's coming out that people can find together uh, creates uh, additional greater risks. So the, the, the positive obligations doctrine under Article 2 raises this question, to what extent uh, should the authorities go, must they go to prevent those risks uh, to life, to, to mitigate those risks? And also, uh, I think it's also important to stress that uh, any failure to prote protect uh, people with particular vulnerabilities could be seen as being discriminatory. Now, the court does have a priority policy, and the first, the very first category, the most urgent cases are those that raise particular risks to life or health. Uh, so it is possible, it seems to me, that the court could apply uh, the, the priority policy uh, quickly. It is capable, we know, of dealing with cases in a matter of months, as it, as it did in the Diane Pretty case against the UK, for example. But again, uh, perhaps a note of realism, the court has been very cautious on its priority policy. Um, and even when a case is considered to be priority, um, those cases can still take many years, as we know from the casework at the European Human Rights Advocacy Centre. My own view on this, for what it's worth, is that I think, um, regardless of the current pandemic, but maybe particularly so during the, the current pandemic, the court should be more, uh, is able to be and should be more discerning and more uh, creative in, in applying the priority policy to fast track cases meaningfully. Um, uh, but I accept that it would be very exceptional. Now, um, let me just then go on to the, the second, briefly to the second area, which was the, uh, the risk of the exploitation of, of emergency powers of authoritarian power grabs of the risk that authoritarian, authoritarian states was used the excuse of the pandemic to, to uh, erode our fundamental rights, stopping gatherings, stopping free movement, uh, and, and increasing surveillance, uh, a number of the issues that have been, have been raised. And we have seen, I think, some very useful statements from different branches of the Council of Europe, as a number of people have mentioned, from the Secretary General, uh, underlining that the rule of law must prevail, um, and statements from the CPT and several statements from the Commissioner, as a number of people have said, focusing on the rights of people with disabilities, on, on free expression, focusing on, on Roma and travellers and prisoners and so on. And I think that that's those focuses are, are right. I would add to that um, that I think the focus of the, of the wider work of the Council of Europe should also be on situations and, and countries where the risk of these abuse of powers, abuses of powers, are the greatest. Um, just to give an example, if you're a human rights activist or an investigative journalist currently in Azerbaijan and you're subject, as everyone is, to the electronic permit system and you're required to uh, send an SMS to the authorities for permission to leave your house for two hours, you're going to, I think, you know, view that kind of restriction rather differently to, to those of us who live in the uh, relatively freer parts of, of, of Europe. It's a, uh, it's a country where Human Rights Watch has been, has been recording uh, arrests of, of journalists and human rights activists for spurious grounds for supposedly breaching lockdown rules and so on. Um, so uh, perhaps partly in response to Veronica's, um, uh, were they calls for suggestions, Veronica, to the Venice Commission, but um, a focus on Hungary, Russia, Turkey, uh, Azerbaijan, to name but a few, uh, I think uh, need, needs to be part of this response. Uh, and maybe we, we need the Parliamentary Assembly uh, to make those requests uh, to, the, to the Venice Commission in relation to those states. And finally, um, 
The last thing I wanted to just briefly mention is the Secretary, Secretary General's article, power under Article 52 to uh, instigate inquiries. Now that this has been, it's been already suggested by some commentators that that, that could be invoked in relation to the use of derogations. I think there's a number of people have said this, as far as I know, there's 10 state derogations so far, it may be more than that, but um, the, the power could be used in, in relation to derogations. I would certainly support that. And I, in fact, I'd go wider and suggest that the power could be used more broadly, certainly to review emergency powers more, more, more broadly, or states' responses to, uh, to the pandemic uh, across the board. It needs to be done swiftly, of course, uh, and it needs to uh, underline that these measures must be limited, they must be temporary, and they must be subject to proper scrutiny, parliamentary scrutiny, and other, uh, other means of you know, democratic accountability. But um, there have been some problems with the Article 52 process in the, in the past in terms of the way in which states uh, have provided information and replies to the Secretary General, and also the way in which those replies are then scrutinised. So I think that needs to be to be improved, we need to get that right. Um, thank you very much, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Phil, it was extremely useful. I know that you uh, need to go now, right? Uh, and uh, I, I would like to thank you for, for, for that and I'm hoping that you will be able to join us uh, uh, for in, in, in the future for next uh, uh, webinars on the topic. And at the moment, I wanted to pass the floor to pass the uh, responsibility of being a chair to Stuart, who will handle questions and answers. Uh, we are down to only three um, panelists, but uh, uh, nevertheless, we are still uh, keen to hear your comments and questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Constantine. So um, we're just going to run this uh, as we did the previous one. Uh, if people would like to ask a question, they can raise their hand and then we will just uh, open the floor up to them. I see immediately uh, Alan has jumped in. So um, I'll switch over to you, Alan, um, if you can uh, just unmute you and put on your video. There you go, there. Yeah. Um, so over to you, Alan. Question. Yeah, great. Yeah, the, the, all really interesting contributions from uh, from the panelists. My my question, I suppose, is specifically for Rob. Uh, I'm just wondering why you could elaborate a bit more on this argument about the lack of a need to declare an emergency and derogate under under Article 15. Uh, could you just elaborate a bit more as to why you think that Article 15 wasn't necessary? Uh, and whether you could address maybe some of the concerns that have been raised by some, I suppose, including myself, about the, the actual human rights problems that arise from not declaring an emergency. So, for example, the recalibration of the, of the, of the existing human rights frameworks to accommodate what we can all agree are not normal powers. These are exceptional powers. And in turn, whether those powers could potentially be applied beyond this pandemic. So I note as well that the UK has not uh, ratified Protocol 4, uh, which protects the right to freedom of movement. So what is stopping these powers that are existing, you know, to control this pandemic from, say, being applied to other situations, uh, like, for example, counter-terrorism, uh, etc.? Does the UK only view the declaration of an emergency as, as a problematic uh, imposition on human rights rather than a defender of it and when when is when would article 15 actually be used is it only used for maybe more questionable emergencies uh where where you know it, its objective existence is 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 more questionable thank you Great, thank you very much for your question, Alan. Just a, a quick note to everyone else before uh, I let you come in on that, uh, Rob, and give you a bit of time to think about it. <laughs> uh, if anyone would like to ask a question, they can also do so in the chat. So we'll keep an eye on that. And if something pops up there, please feel free, if you don't want to come on camera and speak, um, to contribute there as well. Over to you, um, Rob, to ask that, answer that lovely, uh, easy question. Um, <laughs> no, or, or blizzard of questions, I think I'm going to say, actually. It's, um, <laughs> Uh, crikey, where do I start with that one? Um, let's start first with what the the Act of Parliament in question, what the powers do. 
Um, because these are discretionary powers to allow the government to take measures to slow the spread of the virus, essentially. Um, they are temporary measures. And one of the very important points to make here is that not only does the government have to report to Parliament on the use of the powers every two months, but it requires MPs to express a view on the continued use of those powers every six months. These are not permanent powers. But the key point to make about that piece of legislation, um, I used to be responsible for the Human Rights Act uh, policy on that in a, in a previous life, if I can put it like that. Um, we, of course, make a statement under Section 19.1 of the Human Rights Act on the face of every bill presented to either House of Parliament. And the statement on this one was a statement of compatibility. It was a 19.1a statement saying that the powers in this legislation not only are compatible with the convention rights in the government's view, but would therefore be exercised compatibly with the convention rights. So it's not to say that a state of emergency is a bad thing or a derogation is somehow a problematic thing. Um, I, 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 I've been hanging around this brief long enough that I remember when we did previously derogate. And the, the key thing though is in our view that if you can keep the ordinary human rights framework operating, then you should. Derogation is only when it is necessary. It's not a question of desirable. It's not a question of academically arguable. Is it necessary? And in the government's view, the, the legislation that was put forward could and will be operated compatibly with all of the obligations under the Human Rights Act. You're, you're right to say the UK hasn't ratified Protocol 4. Uh, we signed it in 1963 and we still haven't ratified it, so I wouldn't hold your breath on that one. Uh, it's not to do with Article 4 of it at all. It's to do with the um, uh, uh, an issue, if memory serves, to do with different categories of British nationality and expulsion from your country. It's all rather complicated. Um, uh, so the, the short answer is what stops these powers being used for, for other things? The short answer is a combination of parliamentary control and the terms of those powers themselves. So it's not is derogating somehow showing respect for rights to our view operating the usual framework of rights is showing respect for rights. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Rob. Um, up next, we have uh, Natasha who wants to ask a question and then afterwards uh, we'll ask Frederick, um, who's also raised his hand. So um, I'll just switch over to you. Um, so you're unmuted. You may, you may address the... <laughs> thank you, Stuart. Hi, everyone. Thank you for a really interesting seminar. Um, and also I should say hello to Veronica, whom I haven't seen in a very long time. It's really nice to see you again. Um, I, I suppose my question is for everyone, um, although it is largely sort of a, it has arisen in response to something that um, uh, Rob Linham said in relation to organizations and bodies sticking to their strengths. Um, and that is a question about deference and what, um, what we anticipate to occur in terms of how human rights bodies understand their competences and the deference that they need to show in respect of certain decisions or aspects of, cert aspects of certain decisions and practices, um, whether we worry that instead of showing due deference, they might show sort of undue or excessive deference in certain, um, on certain issues, and whether that does run the risk of leading to a sort of recalibration, a leveling down uh, uh, in terms of human rights protections that also has this kind of contamination potential beyond this particular crisis. Um, so that's kind of my, my broad question about what kind of levels of deference we might anticipate by particular human rights institutions, as opposed to speaking to the, to the bodies that um, the, the panelists have referred to. And then sort of an added question to that is whether maybe this crisis is a situation in which we might have to rethink and reconfigure how we understand sort of optimal levels of deference uh, or lack thereof um, uh, when there are really important, uh, quite critical and urgent, um, as, as Phil highlighted, urgent human rights issues at stake. Thank you. 
Perfect. Thank you very much, Natasha. Uh, do you want to respond to directly to that, Veronica? Um, I've unmuted you there if you want to um, contribute. <laughs> I can start, yes. Uh, thank you for the question and nice seeing you again. Uh, it's an interesting question. And the first issue I would mention, and it goes back to the previous question, is that the court, I mean, the European court has repeatedly held that in cases when the government, when the state does not derogate, then it will, it will hold it accountable under the usual standard. So that's the first question that will need to be clarified, whether really the lack of derogation means that the usual standard will be applied. And what would that mean in this case? Would there be still some space for, uh, for unusual measures in what seems to be not so unusual times in the end? So that is the first question. The second one, uh, or the, the second issue, that, the second point that I want to make in this respect is that what we see here is actually a clash of two logics, and it will be for the courts and other bodies to consider how these logics, which are, go in different directions, should be put together. So the first logic is the logic of human rights, which tell us that restrictions should be as, as, as uh, limited as possible, I mean, restrictions of human rights, and that the def deference granted to states should be also as limited as possible. That's one logic. And on the other hand, the logic of, I don't know how to call it, logic of emergency situations, when we operate in, also in a situation of, uncertain, of uncertainty and which could be labeled as the logic of, I don't know, preventive caution. That means that you rather uh, give more space to the governments and they rather do more than they would do otherwise because they simply do not know what will work. So these two logics seem to be working against each other and we will see what the, what the courts will do with that. I don't have, I have questions, as you can see. I don't have answers. And maybe if I've already had the floor, because I will need to leave in a couple of minutes, if I may go back to the previous question, because the Czech Republic is also one of the countries which have not derogated from the European Convention, despite the fact that, as was mentioned earlier by Konstantin, the Czech emergency regime is one of the strictest one in Europe, and it's actually quite interesting to see there is a clear pattern of derogation in Europe. It basically starts east of Slovakia, maybe, and that anyone who is to the to the to the one side has derogated, or almost anyone, and anyone who is to the other side has not derogated. So we have discussed this issue in the Czech Republic, and uh, the explanation provided for not derogating is twofold. So first, there is the impression, and that's a bit, I think for discussion, that's a bit, might be surprising, is that the emergency we are facing today does not actually meet the definition or, of war and other, what is it, other public emergency threatening the life of the nation, so that we are not in this situation so far yet at all, I don't know. So that's one prong of the argument. And the other one is similar as was explained for the United Kingdom, namely that the measures that the Czech Republic uh, has been taking up to now can be justified under the limitation clause, under the normal standard, provided at the same time that the Czech Republic, unlike the United Kingdom, has ratified all the protocols, including the one on movement. Now, I'm not that sure about the latter issue either, provided that, as I mentioned earlier, the court has mentioned or repeatedly held that in the state of non-derogation, the normal standard should apply. But that's just to complement on, on this issue. And I will have to say goodbye to you now. It, it's been really a pleasure. So thank you and see you hopefully next time in the real life scenario. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much uh, for joining us, Ron, again, for your insights. Um, would any of the other panelists like to respond to Natasha's question now? Uh, that's okay. You're, you're okay. Okay, great. Um, we'll move on to uh, Frederick next. And then after that, we have David. And I think we'll wrap things up after that. Okay. Yes, so um, uh, Frederick, I will pass over the floor to you. So you are unmuted. Please uh, contribute your question. Hi, thank you very much everyone and uh, thanks especially to Stuart and Constant for organising this. My question is really directed to the remaining panellists and it's just quite simple uh, and it sort of follows quite neatly on from the question that Natasha just asked as well. In the event of a challenge either on a non-derogating or on a derogating state, in an event of the challenge in 
reaction to any of the measures introduced that restrict rights here that was taken uh, to the court. There is the potential for a very large and very pronounced backlash from a state arguing that the measures are part of national necessity. Um, I mean, I'm thinking basically about what happens if there is a large scale challenge to the emergency decrees in Hungary. How I'm interested to know from the panelists is how robust do they think the convention system is going to be in dealing with this? And especially given the fact that, as the, was stated, that the Council of Europe is operating in a slightly different way, how robust are the institutions in being able to deal with potentially a state that uh, decides to take the European Court of Human Rights on, so to speak, uh, at this time or during this time of emergency, which is likely to carry on for some considerable time. Hey, um, uh, another easy question to respond to there uh, for the panelists. Um, would uh, would uh, Rob or Jörg, would you like to respond to that one? No. <laughs> I'm happy to speak to Jörg if he wants first go at that one. I don't mind. I can, yes. Um, yeah, I wanted more um, to come back to the previous questions. I think uh, this risk uh, that the court will show excessive or too much deference uh, in respect of these measures uh, because precisely they are taken in such extraordinary times. I think this could be an argument to derogate uh, because the derogations also make it clear that there is a very special situation. It's not the normal regime that applies uh, and uh, we are not under, we are in an emergency situation, not a normal situation. And in fact, some of the states, it's also interesting, they're quite different, the derogations we have received. Uh, not all of them mention explicit rights. Uh, some of them just uh, lock, stock and barrel say that our measures may involve or involve uh, derogations to certain rights. And this is a led technique uh, that the court has more or less accepted uh, in Turkish cases, because I think Turkey and, and France, uh, after the terror attacks, they used this very broad formulation, uh, which also given the circumstances is, there are maybe probably good reasons uh, not to be sure how far the measures taken uh, will actually interfere with the rights. And some also, for example, Romania, they have a broad framework uh, and then they adopt day by day, uh, so to speak, more measures. Uh. But I think derogations in this sense have also a positive effect uh, because it makes clear to the court, but also then to the, to the general public that we are not a norm, normal situation. Uh, and that could maybe then also the case law developed by the court could be clearly classified. This is case law under very particular emergency situations. Uh. But anyway, this was just a reflection on this, on the, yeah, what to do with states that consistently do not comply with judgment or do not enforce or implement them. Then this is an issue for the Committee of Ministers. <laughs> Rob knows where is the expert <laughs> on the, I think there we will, we have, I think there's this discussion, the Committee of Ministers, uh, what measures has the committee uh, in these cases, uh, how far, this is a bit this, um, the problem with the, in this whole uh, context um, of the supervision of judgments that there is not a clear sanction, gradual sanction system. Uh, we have not this system of the court in Luxembourg that uh, the member states probably also with good reasons, never wanted to introduce financial penalties. Uh, so we are left with either more or less symbolic acts. And then and, and of course, uh, resolu interim resolutions, decisions, uh, ministers are more and more asked to, to directly come before the committee and, and uh, take account uh, of what they have done on, on a certain judgment. But still, if there is really persistent uh, failure, 
uh, then there is not much uh, of a gradual sanction regime. Uh, and um, this issue is something certainly the Committee of Ministers will, will have to, to reflect further on. And there may be, unfortunately, cases where this may come quite soon. Uh, I think someone mentioned already Azerbaijan. <laughs> and there are issues, certainly, um, this the Committee of Ministers will, will have to face quite soon. Uh. And yeah, I think I stop here. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, Rob, uh, Veronica, who would like to deal with that hospital pass from Jorg uh, first? Would that be <laughs> uh, Veronica? Would like to go first? Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there. sorry, um, sorry. There you go. Yeah. I disappeared. Two quick comments. The first one, uh, just as a follow up to what what Jorg was talking about. This is not a new issue because we have already had cases in which the the judgments of the uh, European Court have not been respected or have been rejected explicitly. So this would not be new and I do not expect that the, I'd say the scale of non-respect would be higher than in what seems to be normal time. So that's the first comment and it has to do with my second comment on this. I actually do not think that the main problem in this respect will be in the relationship between states and the European Court because my personal guess, and it's just a guess, is that the European Court will first take some time to decide, and second, it will rather show deference to, to national authorities who will not show deference to the executive and who have not already shown deference to, to the executive are national courts. So what I expect might be the, the a certain development in the relationship between national courts and the other sectors of the power, especially the executive. And we have already seen a couple of decisions uh, coming from national courts, uh, criticizing the executive uh, uh, decisions and not always being uh, accepted uh, by the executive uh, in, in the best way. So I rather expect a development in, in this line, which, I, which obviously might have an impact on the international level later on. Excellent. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, over to you, Rob, for the last word uh, today. So last question, you get the final word. It's, it's always the best position to be in, I think, in any kind of a, a webinar. So um, oh, we, we haven't got one more question. I thought there was somebody else as well. So, um, OK, well, I mean, I think a lot of what needs to be said on this has already been said, despite the, um, uh, the passing of the diplomatic book there by Jörg. Um, once again, it, it, as Veronica says, it's not a new issue. Um, it is an issue that the multilateral system generally finds uniquely challenging. Because when you have a system that is such as the Council of Europe, based on the, the interaction of sovereign states, there is, in the end, only so much that the international system can do. The ultimate sanction is is ostracism. It is to throw a state out of the international system, essentially. But of course, that is often a self-defeating step to take, because that in itself releases the state from the obligations in question. And we so often see the efforts being taken to calibrate, on the one hand, putting pressure on states to comply with the obligations that they freely accepted, to comply with the, the decisions of the bodies that oversee them. But on the other hand, to keep those states within the system, if I can put it like that. Um, I, I also agree with Veronica, I don't think this is necessarily going to lead to a massive increase in the problem. Will it change how we address it? I don't think it will either in the end. Ultimately, it is that same calibration. Ultimately, there is no way, finally, that the Council of Europe can force a state to comply with a judgment. It has to be a combination of such sanctions that are at our disposal, a combination of diplomatic measures, persuasion, disapproval. Mm -hmm. uh, it may look sometimes almost slightly weak from the outside, but it's the best we have in international diplomacy because it's the foundation that the whole system is built on. Um, and I don't, I mean, we, with great respect, Frederick, for the question, I don't think that I'm necessarily concerned that this is going to become a problem in a new way that it hasn't already. 
Excellent. Well, thank you for um, thank you for that interjection, Rob, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, possibly a uh, slightly unoptimistic note to end on, but uh, it's been uh, really, really great. I'd like to thank all of our speakers for joining us, um, and especially for you guys who, who are still uh, with us for the final question. So um, thank you very much to all of you. Um, uh, as Constantine's mentioned, we will be hosting another one of these in two weeks' time. Keep an eye on Twitter where you found out uh, more of these details, and we'll be posting more details about who the speakers are. But thank you very much, uh, all of you, for joining us. And um, I'll bring the end to the proceedings there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.